Good evening. Uh, so nice to be with you this evening on this live webinar. Uh, we've had a lot of uh, questions uh, from a lot of people regarding the role of neurotransmitters in mood, uh, particularly in regards to the secret of our success in enhancing brain biochemistry. Uh, and so I thought it would be worthwhile for us to do an entire uh, webinar on this topic. And we can also use some case reports that uh, are, are complex and were unsolvable uh, in the traditional uh, psychiatric and medical world uh, that uh, completely turned around as a result of the approach um, that is taken in a comprehensive manner to enhance brain biochemistry. And so, of course, we've had uh, scores of those examples. We've had uh, uh, thousands of people go through our community program, over 10,000, and, and um, uh, we're almost 2,000 going through the residential uh, program. And uh, we have so many uh, stories of, um, of absolute transformation and success, and it really has to do a lot with the area uh, that I play a role in which is the brain biochemistry uh, aspect of things. So uh, today we're going to explore how determining the causes of lack of synaptic activity or excessive synaptic activity can help formulate effective solutions. And uh, we'll begin to explain nutritional approaches that have demonstrated success in clinical trials as well as in our programs. And we'll also branch over to some non-nutritional approaches that will also improve brain biochemistry and improve uh, mental health issues. And then we'll see how this information can apply in regards to some real life cases. So uh, first, the mental health crisis that we are all in today, mental illness is exploding. It actually is an epidemic. It's an epidemic that actually has touched more lives than COVID has around the world. And the mental health complications of COVID have exceeded the financial and physical complications according to uh, polls uh, done around the world. And in the United States, uh, Gallup poll uh, indicated that people have been far more adversely affected by the mental health consequences uh, than the other consequences. And of course, those other consequences we tend to focus in on, the media spends a lot of time on it, uh, but the mental health portion of things has been sadly neglected. Uh, not to say that uh, the physical health consequences are not severe, and uh, the financial consequences have um, also, of course, been severe. But uh, it's just to indicate how bad the mental health crisis has become. And we already had an epidemic in our society prior to COVID. So major depression, uh, now one out of two people in the Western world have actually suffered from major depression. And generalized anxiety disorder is also common. In fact, if we were to add up all of the anxiety disorders, including uh, things uh, like attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, which is a cousin of an anxiety disorder, or post-traumatic stress disorder, or obsessive compulsive disorder, um, social phobias, um, those would actually exceed the rates of depression. And so we're looking at you know, greater than uh, one out of two um, suffering from anxiety. And in our program, uh, we actually specialize in all of these things. Sometimes we'll have people just with anxiety, just with depression, uh, but we often have people where their primary issue is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, or their primary issue is obsessive compulsive disorder, or PTSD, or other types of phobias, or things that have really adversely affected their performance in their family and in academia, as well as uh, in the workplace. Relationship issues are also significantly affected by uh, mental uh, challenges. And uh, in fact, virtually every relationship, when we have formed a very good relationship and that good relationship begins to fail or deteriorate, 
it's most often due to a mental health issue on the part of one of the relationship partners or both of the relationship partners. And so we're seeing relationship issues at an all-time high. And sometimes even just casual relationships that were hardly say casual, we're just meeting in Costco, uh, they say fights in stores are at an all-time high. And just uh, meeting someone and uh, having that person uh, tick you off <laughs> where you're uh, raising your voice and, and threatening things are set in stores. And, um, you know, we almost have to have our retail um, salespeople now be, be mental health interventional uh, people in regards to uh, solving anger issues and those sorts of things uh, with the deterioration in mental health that has occurred in our world the last few years. Self-harm is also at an all-time high. The latest study, there's one coming out this year, but the latest study in 2014 showed 26% of females under the age of 25 will self-harm on a regular basis, cutting, uh, and it's about a third of that amount in males, but that's uh, dramatically increasing. Suicidal thoughts are at an all-time high, as well as suicidal action, uh, essentially uh, almost a million people um, killed themselves the, um, last year. That's a huge city that's wiped out in our world uh, every year. And it turns out only about one out of 20 that, uh, that are uh, less than one out of 20 that are seriously contemplating suicide actually end up committing suicide. And so suicidal thoughts are even um, far worse than that figure, we'd be looking at millions and millions of people that have thought that they might be better off dead and have even considered accelerating their demise. And then when we take a look at the academic and work and financial consequences, it's even uh, worse. Um, the last study showed that a person with depression is gonna lose on average uh, $10,500 of income, US dollars per year. And uh, that was back in, the, in 2012. And so you can imagine that the effect of that is even more. Anxiety disorders also do this. And of course, this is why if we invest in our own mental health and the mental health of our loved ones, we are sure to reap financial benefits uh, for this. In fact, uh, one of the reasons why people don't seek comprehensive solutions to their mental uh, health uh, issues like coming to a program such as ours that uh, would have um, the solution uh, is because of the cost. And in reality, if they would um, invest in their mental health, they would reap that benefit year after year. And so the, the typical person will lose over $300,000 in uh, lifetime income uh, with mental health challenges instead of taking care of it um, you know, earlier rather than later. In fact, the number one complaint we have of people that leave our program is, I should have done this a long time ago, uh, and I would have saved myself uh, so many issues. So let's get to the actual role of neurotransmitters. Uh, lack of serotonin activity is the target number one of the pharmaceutical industry because serotonin has such uh, a significant effects when the synaptic activity of serotonin goes down. Feeling down, more irritable, uh, insomnia, early morning awakening, these are signs of low serotonin synaptic activity. And then when we get to feeling on edge and even experiencing panic, uh, that's uh, even more of an indicator that we have low serotonin activity. The typical person uh, that is genetically set up for low serotonin activity will tend to have a calm ex exterior. Everyone thinks that they're under control, but inside they're tense. And they even have tendencies to ruminate and maybe even obsess about things. Uh, as their serotonin activity goes down, their impulsivity will tend to worsen so they can make some poor decisions. And uh, this trait also tends to come with the addictive personality trait. So if we're set up for low serotonin activity, um, that would be, mean, for instance, a genetic undermethylator. This is what goes along with the gene for alcoholism and other addictions. 
Uh, as the serotonin activity falls, we'll see worse executive function, meaning that the frontal lobe um, activity and function will tend to go down. And uh, we'll also see some blood tests that indicate this. Of course, these blood tests can be affected by medication. So we always have to know the medicines on board when we take these blood tests. But in general, a whole blood histamine greater than 70 means indeed that the patient is underactive in their serotonin activity and is an undermethylator. And then there are other blood tests that can confirm this, such as a low S-adenosyl methionine level, which we'll get into, or an S-adenosyl methionine level um, that is related to S-adenosyl homocysteine of less than six. These would be all signs of lack of serotonin um, activity. Once serotonin activity becomes adequate, however, we will see some significant transformative changes in the individual. This individual will tend to not be so much self-focused, but will now be able to empathize with others more easily. Um, they're not as easily irritated, meaning that they can undergo significant stresses and it seems to be like water off a duck's back. Doesn't really bother them uh, that much. Uh, and as a result of that, they're better at self-control. If you can't manage your emotions, you really can't have comprehensive self-control. But when we can start managing our emotions, we can do a lot better in self-control. We're more creative and artistic. We will see this especially in those with their genetic overmethylators. Their creativity and, and artistry presents itself at a very early age. Music comes easy for them and they love to be uh, creative or if exposed uh, musical. And uh, their impulsivity will actually be improved when their serotonin activity goes up and their frontal lobe function will go up, meaning that they're able to uh, plan more wisely for the future as well as uh, be able to exercise more willpower. Uh, in general, people with adequate serotonin levels tend to make great neighbors because they care about others. They make great workmates, also because they're caring about others and they're able to have that comprehensive self-control and they make great family members as well. So you can imagine why the pharmaceutical industry has targeted um, serotonin. And so how have they actually targeted it? What are these drugs actually doing? Well, the original drugs were actually trying to help you to keep the serotonin you made in your brain longer. We called those monoamine oxidase inhibitors to prevent the deterioration of serotonin and other neurotransmitters. But these were highly dangerous drugs that tended to raise blood pressure. You had to be very careful on your diet. You couldn't eat cheese. You couldn't eat a whole list of foods because you could get malignant hypertension and actually die from a stroke. And so, uh, finally, the more um, newer agents were actually just blocking the serotonin reuptake channels. If you see on the screen there in the side, those are the serotonin reuptake transporter agent, uh, uh, I, sh I should say channels, that are transporting serotonin back up into the neuron. Why are those um, channels there? Uh, simply so that we don't have to continue to make serotonin but can reuse it. So when serotonin is bound by that receptor and electrical transmission occurs, then it's released by that receptor, as you can see, and vacuumed back up. But if we have a shortage of serotonin uh, production or a shortage of serotonin receptors, it's thought that if we plug those reuptake channels, those vacuum cleaners, we could call them, then there'll be more serotonin in the synapse to get more serotonin activity. And voila, it actually does work short term for a few months. Uh, in those that have low serotonin activity, their symptoms will tend to get better. They'll be able to manage their emotions. Their crying spells can even go away. Uh, their family notices um, that they're not so ticked off as easily or as agitated. And uh, they're more popular. But unfortunately, uh, because there was a shortage of serotonin to begin with, and now we are not reuptaking the serotonin, we actually deplete the neuron further. And so within a few months, the patient needs higher doses, they have relapse, they're even needing more medicines, and this is how psychiatric cripples can develop 
where the individual is tied to a psychiatrist, uh, altering and adjusting medications, changing medicines because they quit working, and, uh, and still um, experiencing significant uh, mental health issues. A far better approach is to actually increase the neuron's ability to make serotonin. And uh, none of the drugs can do this. None of the drugs actually build up your receptors either. Uh, this is what requires nutrition and lifestyle approaches. And so, uh, and, and it's simply why nutrition and lifestyle approaches most often trump uh, medication approaches. Not that we can't use both. Uh, there are certain patients, of course, as a doctor, I may prescribe these medicines as well, usually on a short-term basis until we solve the underlying uh, issues uh, in the receptor level or also at the, um, at the biochemical production level. Uh, and so what we really want to do is help the brain make more serotonin. That's not actually easy. It's not as easy as the GI tract making serotonin. Your intestinal tract makes serotonin, but it can make it far easier. The reason why it's harder in the brain is because tryptophan is a large molecule that is not taken up by the brain. You just don't just diffuse tryptophan into your brain when you eat chicken or turkey. Uh, it actually might go into your muscles, but not into your brain. It has to have a transporter to um, take it up. And that requires a more specific form of diet, which we'll get into in a little bit. But I also wanted to touch on the role of other neurotransmitters. We're going to primarily emphasize serotonin and methylation today. We may have other webinars in the future where we emphasize some of these others, but I still wanted you to see some of the differences between which uh, neurotransmitters might be in short or oversupply. So if you're lacking dopamine, your motivation is gonna go down. Um, your motivation for worthy goals, for being healthy even, can go down. Uh, things that you used to be interested in pursuing, you're no longer interested in. That's a problem with dopamine. If you're not interested in the new day, when you wake up, you're not excited about the day. You actually get up out of a sense of duty, but not because you're excited or interested in what that day may offer. That is a problem with dopamine, and we call that apathy. Uh, things that used to be pleasurable are no longer pleasurable. Uh, and you used to enjoy doing certain things, and those things no longer enjoyable, clearly a dopamine issue. And weight gain can also occur with a lack of dopamine, uh, but you could also get into a low appetite and weight loss if your low dopamine is accompanied by a high norepinephrine and imbalance between these new two neurotransmitters. If you're seeking what we call super stimuli, these are people that are addicted to their smartphones. Uh, these are people that uh, need to have this stimulation. They need to be on YouTube. Um, they're afraid of being bored. Um, and uh, they're doing things that might even be risky uh, at times with these super stimuli. This is clearly a dopamine problem. And uh, those with low dopamine are very likely to fall into addictions uh, as a result. Uh, they can become very easily discouraged as well when they have low dopamine levels. And uh, one of the signs uh, that we look for is actually looking at how we metabolize metals. But a free copper level, this is not just measuring your serum copper, you have to measure the ceruloplasmin and calculate the free copper level. A, a high copper to zinc ratio or a fr excess um, free copper level of 30% or more is associated with low dopamine and actually high norepinephrine. It shoves our tyrosine into norepinephrine and away from dopamine. Norepinephrine can be a problem with not enough or too much. Norepinephrine is a cousin of adrenaline, so you might imagine this is what helps give us energy and focus. So if we don't have enough, we have fatigue and we have lack of focus. If we have too much, we're going to be uh, having that cousin of adrenaline causing excessive worry, being able to be easily distracted, racing thoughts that we can't shut down. And uh, we'll also see with the imbalance between norepinephrine and dopamine, if there's too much norepinephrine, not enough dopamine, 
we will see hormonal depression. So these are people that uh, have premenstrual syndrome or premenstrual dysphoric disorder where they're much more irritable before their periods or they're going to be set up for significant postpartum um, depression. And uh, if we don't have enough uh, norepinephrine, we're going to get into memory decline uh, because of the lack of focus. We're going to get into wanting to sleep all the time. And these people can even sleep too much. We've had some of them come to our program that are sleeping up to 20 hours a day, barely awake long enough to survive. Uh, and, and too much, we, as mentioned, we can get into the weight loss. So another neurotransmitter that's very important, it's also a hormone, is the neurotransmitter melatonin, which also requires methylation. It requires a one carbon addition to make melatonin from serotonin. And melatonin is your fix and rejuvenate nighttime hormone. It increases your ability to experience pleasure uh, and it helps you to manage stress. And when we're lacking in good, efficient sleep or the sleep cycles, we can run into this in part due to low melatonin levels. And another neurotransmitter that we can um, talk about is gamma aminobutyric acid. These are what we call GABA and there are GABA receptors. And this is a different type of neurotransmitter. It's called an inhibiting neurotransmitter. And when this neurotransmitter comes about, it makes the neuron much more resistant to excitability. And uh, that can be a calming agent. And thus, this can help with anxiety. GABA is there to help us under stress to not get so stressed out. Uh, and so we can still have a sense of peace uh, even though there is significant um, you know, challenges going on around us. And of course, GABA uh, can also help with sleep and uh, stress control as well. So let's get into the, uh, the methylation aspect of things. There are a number of systems that depend on methylation, not just neurotransmitter production. We need methylation to make not only serotonin, melatonin, we need it for norepinephrine, we need it for dopamine. Uh, but it also helps to regulate our DNA and RNA synthesis. It helps uh, with a number of things as you can see on the screen. We won't go into all of them, but nitric oxide production is important as well. This can keep our circulation good, keep our blood vessels relaxed, uh, energy production, uh, our gene regulation has to do with methylation and even our immune function and our endothelial function. So uh, methylation is needed throughout the body and this is why if you took an advanced biochemistry class in college, you probably learned about the methylation pathway. Uh, there's a few things I'd like to point out on this methylation pathway. Uh, notice S-adenosyl methionine. This is over here on the right hand big circle um, as it's coming down, at the very top is methionine. We're going to mention that. We need methionine to methylate. But it takes um, ATP and some potassium and Uh, on this biochemical circle, but I'd like to um, uh, go into a little bit of uh, what <clears throat> methylation <laughs> does and what it helps us with. Uh, and 
Uh, as I mentioned, uh, numerous methylation reactions in the body. Decreased levels of SAMe commonly occur, however, in the presence of folate or B12 deficiency. Folate is something that is way undersupplied in um, a carnivore diet, and um, it's hard, sometimes hard to get even in a plant-based diet. We have to center in on things like black-eyed peas and lentils and the greens, uh, okra, to get enough um, folate. Uh, low SAMe levels have also been associated with uh, not only depression, but um, dementia, um, liver disease, and uh, vacuolar myelopathy. Uh, and so we want to have enough SAMe on board to prevent this, uh, these uh, possible um, changes. Methylation inhibition is caused by S adenosyl homocysteine, which we can also measure in the blood. It's a research laboratory that measures this. Commercial labs don't, don't do this, so these are part of the specialized blood tests that we often do in our residential program. And since adenosyl homocysteine has been shown to inhibit methylation, um, this, uh, the ratio is often used as an index of the methylation status. And as I mentioned earlier, best index is six or above. So uh, when serotonin is short, a lot of people thought, well, you know, we need more tryptophan. Tryptophan is the amino acid that turns into serotonin. But as you can see on the screen here, uh, tryptophan is transported into the brain by a transport system that is active toward all the large neutral amino acids, of which tryptophan is one and tyrosine as well. The problem with tryptophan is it's the least abundant amino acid in the diet. And there's competition between the various amino acids for the transport system. So after the ingestion of a meal containing protein, the rise in the plasma level of the large, large, other large neutral amino acids will prevent the rise in plasma tryptophan from increasing brain tryptophan. So in other words, the carrier will take off those, uh, across these other neutral amino acids, which we don't need so much because those are in abundant supply, and we have a shortage of tryptophan in the brain from eating protein uh, or too much protein. And so as this uh, neuroscience article stated, the idea common in popular culture that a high protein food such as turkey will raise brain tryptophan and serotonin is unfortunately false. And uh, this is important to recognize because we want to have the right tryptophan foods that will not just go into our muscle, but go into our brain. And we have previously described those tryptophan foods in our uh, presentations, our online presentations on Optimize Your Brain, and also in depression and anxiety recovery. So we won't cover them um, all now, but I will state that um, it looks like, at least at this point in time, that Dr. Simon, who was the author of that article, uh, will be coming to our EQ Summit uh, next year. And so uh, look for him. He's one of the, the experts in the world in regards to nutrition and brain biochemistry. So when there's a serotonin shortage, it's often due to insufficient tryptophan getting into the brain. Maybe not getting into the diet. It could be a dietary issue as well, but just getting into the brain. And of course, we need tryptophan for the two neurotransmitters, serotonin and melatonin, and also for niacin. The conversion of tryptophan to 5-HTP is inhibited by stress, insulin resistance, magnesium deficiency will also cause us to not get tryptophan uh, uh, to serotonin. It will um, not allow that to happen. Or a vitamin B6 deficiency, lack of light, or increasing age. This is why light is also important and why everyone in Alaska and northern Norway gets depressed in the wintertime unless they're actually exposed to medical grade light. And light is so important we actually supply that in a medical grade um, light, either wearable light uh, through uh, glasses or through a light box in our program to help uh, produce serotonin as well as to reset our circadian rhythm. So L-methionine is one of the 
um, important aspects. We need L-methionine, that's essential as well to make S-adenosyl methionine. And we also need B12 in folate. When we measure B12 level, it's, it's clear that some people in the two or 300 range are still not gonna get enough to make enough SAMe. We need to have B12 levels above 500 to consistently make enough SAMe. And so we measure those B12 and folate levels. We need the folate levels above 15 as well. But uh, SAMe is produced when ATP, magnesium, and potassium converge with methionine adenosyl transferase. And then this provides the final methyl group to produce serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine. Too much methionine, however, can be a problem. And this is the problem with meat as well. Meat actually has quite a bit of methionine, but it will tend to have too much. And this can um, shorten our, um, our life, our telomeres, increase the risk of cancer, also increase uh, depression and anxiety risk while elevating homocysteine. In fact, too much SAMe can actually cause uh, anxiety. And so as you see, L-methionine, we need 725 milligrams in our diet, is too high in fish, chicken, beef, and pork. But uh, the foods that can have the right amounts are nuts and seeds. You can see tahini and chia, which we use in our program. 167 milligrams per ounce. Pumpkin seeds, 171 milligrams. Uh, and uh, you can see the legumes and grains. Uh, on the other side, yeah, having even more, the Roman beans, cranberry beans, the red kidney beans, navy beans, large white beans. And then there are hemp seeds, just one ounce of hemp seed, 265, even more than the large white beans, a cup of large white beans. Butter nuts are also a good source, and just six Brazil nuts will give us 319 milligrams. Teff, an interesting grain um, that is used in cooking, 315 milligrams. Edamame, 385, but wheat, 411. I wanted to emphasize wheat because a lot of people are on a gluten-free diet, and if they're on a gluten-free diet, they may not be getting enough methionine if they're not eating a lot of these other foods, and this is why some people on a plant-based diet think they have to have meat because their mood improved at first when they were when they went to meat but actually they don't meet, need meat they just need methionine and uh, they could avoid all the problems of meat by either taking methionine supplement or getting on some of these other foods or they may not be actually gluten sensitive they might just think it's good health to, not, to avoid wheat but it actually isn't if you're not sensitive to it a whole wheat is actually a very good food for the brain this is just one of several reasons. Um, tofu also has a lot of methionine, fortunately. So tryptophan relative to placebo decreases quarrelsome behaviors, increases agreeable behaviors, and improves mood. It improves premenstrual dysphoria even. It improves depression and seasonal affective disorder, insomnia, even obstructive sleep apnea, and drug withdrawal. It's a lot easier to undergo uh, quitting smoking when people come to our program. Every program we have nicotine addicts that have not been able to give it up, but they find success in our program and they're amazed at how easy it is, in part because we are increasing their serotonin manufacturing ability uh, in their brain. In fact, other drugs are far more easily withdrawn in our program as well, such as benzos, opioids, and other addictive drugs uh, for similar reasons. In, stre in stress prone subjects, high carb, low protein food prevents the deterioration of mood and performance under uncontrollable laboratory stress conditions. Stress prone subjects have a higher risk of brain serotonin deficiency. And in sub subjects, higher natural carbs increase personal control. This emphasizes something else. We not only need tryptophan to get into that carrier, we need carbs to be able to get the tryptophan across the blood-brain barrier because it's an insulin-mediated mechanism to get it across. This is why exercise has been shown to significantly help tryptophan get into the brain, as well as a natural carbs. Not a high sugar diet, but the higher natural carbs. Interestingly, regarding depression, there's only one diet that has been shown to have improvement 
in a randomized controlled trial. And this is, of course, the, um, the gold standard is randomized placebo controlled. And uh, this is the only diet that has shown benefit in just two weeks, and it is indeed a plant-based diet. One of the reasons for it is we get a lot more tryptophan into the brain on a plant-based diet. And uh, it's a lot easier for us to make serotonin and to have good executive function, to have good folate levels. Uh, another advantage is it doesn't have arachidonic acid, so we're not adding inflammation to the equation. Depression and anxiety is often due to inflammation in the brain. And uh, if we're not getting the fuel of inflammation, which is arachidonic acid found in meat and eggs and fish, then that it has an additional advantage. Plus, if we're getting our calories from plants, high antioxidants has been shown to be very beneficial as well. So um, uh, plant-based will help us in a number of ways, not the least of which is better tryptophan brain uptake, and it's a lot easier to make serotonin. As mentioned, serotonin regulates executive function and sensory gating, as well as social behavior. But there are some other things that help us with this process. And this is a fatty acid that we're often deficient in in this country, and it's the omega-3 fatty acids. Also, low vitamin D will also cause, cause problems in the brain. Both omega-3 and vitamin D have been shown to improve cognitive function and behavior in ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and also help bipolar disorder. It not only helps the depression and bipolar disorder, but the mania, and it helps even the psychosis aspect and the paranoia as well as impulsive behavior. Serotonin synthesis, release, and function in the brain are modulated by both vitamin D and the two what we call long chain omega-3s. They're called marine omega-3s, not so much because they're from fish, but they're from the plants of the waters. Fish don't make them. They have to get them from the plants of the waters. And these two molecules will actually modulate um, serotonin synthesis. Tryptophan hydroxylase is transcriptionally activated by vitamin D. So this is why we want both of these. And EPA, which is the 20 carbon omega-3, increases serotonin release from presynaptic neurons by reducing the prostaglandin E2 series. DHA, the 22 carbon one, influences serotonin receptor action by increasing cell, main, cell membrane fluidity in postsynaptic neurons. So the EPA is helping the presynaptic neuron, the DHA is helping our receptor pick up that serotonin, and thus they have been uh, able to show a significant benefit in randomized controlled trials. Alpha-linolenic acid is the 18-carbon one that's in land plants, which can convert to EPA and DHA, but this requires B vitamins again, B3, B6, magnesium, zinc, and vitamin C all that have been shown to be very important regarding mental health. Uh, the omega-3 also upregulates brain-derived neurotrophic factor, a fertilizer in the brain. As far as foods that have the ALA, and once again, if we have vitamin C with it, we'll make more of the long-chain omega-3s, oatmeal, whole wheat bread, vitamin C foods, papaya, oranges, um, Brussels sprouts, strawberries, and the ALA foods of um, spinach and uh, uh, broccoli uh, rapine, avocados, navy beans, kale, edamame is very high in omega-3, red bell pepper also an excellent source as is tofu, and one of the highest sources is actually hemp, almost as high as walnuts and chia, but the highest is flaxseed. And you can see the higher vitamin C foods are broccoli, kiwi, black currants, pokeberry shoots, red bell peppers, sweet yellow peppers, uh, just one pomelo. Guavas are an excellent source of vitamin C, and acerola cherries are by far the number one source. This, these foods are mental health foods because they can help our presynaptic and postsynaptic neurons. Zinc has also been singled out, is critically important in mental health. It has been shown to be at, as working as an antidepressant. 
alone or in combination to even pharmaceutical antidepressants. Two weeks of zinc supplementation increases the receptors, the serotonin receptors, both one and two, and it also improves symptoms of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. We've been able to get a lot of ADHD people off their medicine, actually, where they don't even need it anymore just by getting them adequate zinc. Uh, and there may be some other nutritional things that we'll use with it. Garbanzos, lentils, uh, pecans, sunflower seeds, cashews, pine nuts, uh, white beans, uh, kotjong beans, uh, firm tofu, adzuka beans, and baked beans are excellent sources of zinc and you can see uh, the good sources of nuts and seeds with pumpkin seeds, oats, and hemp seeds uh, in the seed category of uh, increasing zinc. And then magnesium, I wanted to center in on that as well because that has a lot to do with increasing brain serotonin levels. It's been shown to improve depression and anxiety in just two weeks. Uh, at 500 milligrams four times daily for a total of 248 milligrams of elemental magnesium per day, uh, we get that significant benefit. And magnesium also helps us methylate and can augment other neurotransmitters including GABA and this is why it's sometimes used as a sleep aid at night. The foods that are highest in magnesium we will list but these are vegetables and seeds and nuts, kale, acorn squash, lima beans, and Swiss chard, and spinach on the vegetable side, chia, sesame seeds, Brazil nuts, flaxseed, and pumpkin seeds on the seeds and nut sides with again hemp seeds leading the pack as far as seeds high in magnesium. And then there are legumes which are an excellent source as are grains. You can see um, teff, yellow cornmeal, amaranth grain is loaded uh, and uh, edamame, also an excellent source, as are uh, kotjang beans and uh, oats. Notice how high oats are in magnesium, and buckwheat is act actually at the top of the list of what are considered grains. Then we have some actual herbal preparations that have been helpful in certain cases. Selexon is a molecule that comes from lavender and it has significant anti-anxiety relieving properties without causing sedation, addiction, or frontal lobe suppression like the other anxiety reducing agents, particularly the benzos, cause. It's also found to be a natural antidepressant. How does Selexon work? One of the ways is it increases serotonin release and extracellular brain serotonin levels. And then the spice saffron. Now ra seven randomized controlled trials show that it has comparable efficacy to traditional antidepressants such as the SSRIs uh, without any of the adverse side effects of SSRIs, the sexual side effects, the I don't care attitude, and those sorts of things. Um, it also improves memory and PMS and it'll take four to six weeks for maximum effect. It's actually improved memory even better than the leading drug for Alzheimer's. And then what might we do in regards to non-nutritional approaches. We mentioned light therapy. We need light through the eyes to increase serotonin synthesis and have our brain ready to make melatonin at night. It does improve mood and improves social interaction. Physical exercise is also key. Several lines of research suggest that exercise increases brain serotonin levels and activity in the hippocampus and frontal lobe in human beings and an increase in brain serotonin precursor tryptophan that persists after exercise. So we get more tryptophan going into the brain as a result of the exercise and post-exercise. When we exercise to fatigue in the morning, really aggressive exercise, we even get a better effect. Increase in plasma tryptophan will occur and a decrease in the plasma levels of those competing branch chain amino acids that inhibit tryptophan transport into the brain. And so this is why people often need a program. It's not necessarily a supplement, as good as it might be to be on SAMe if you're an undermethylator and if you have low serotonin activity, but you also actually need the other things that go with it. The significant exercise, you need the light, uh, and you're going to need other things 
such as we will speak about uh, next. And working on changing your thoughts. <clears throat> so many people these days have negative automatic thoughts. Studies show that the typical person will have 80% of their thoughts negative and 95% of them repetitive. And this actually adversely affects their brain chemistry. As we become happier, we actually have better serotonin synthesis. This has been shown in the right to anterior cingulate cortex of the frontal lobe. Self-induced changes in mood can influence serotonin synthesis. And the interaction between serotonin synthesis and mood is actually two ways. Serotonin influences mood, of course, we've talked about that, but mood actually influences serotonin. And so this is why it also tends to require a program where we can start building the positive emotions and the therapist and the spiritual counselor and all the rest of the staff are actually very good at helping this process along. The ideal ratio of positive and negative emotions is not 10 to 1 or 100 to 1. It's actually 3 to 1. We want to have some negative emotions. Those can be motivating in certain situations to help us to change. Uh, but the tipping point is 3 to 1. So if it's less than 3 to 1, a lot of people are not going to be able to do these things on their own to change positively, and that's why they uh, would likely need a program to change. Then cognitive behavioral therapy. So many people have come to our program because of our expertise in brain biochemistry and wanting to know precisely their issues. We will be able to find them and be able to identify exactly what those issues are and what we might need to do biochemically. But the CBT turns out to be important as well because we can pr produce perfect biochemistry in the brain, but if the thoughts are on these highways of these negative automatic thoughts that are irrational and distorted, those highways are still going to be there. And so it requires work with a therapist to actually shut down those highways uh, and create new thought highways that are more rational and helpful. And that's where we enter CBT. It's the gold standard in psychotherapy and uh, has so much evidence-based research behind it. The studies show if you change your thoughts, you will change your emotions and behaviors. And so we work on establishing healthy connectivity of brain regions, building empathy, increasing gray matter in the prefrontal cortex. CBT will actually do that. It's a frontal lobe enhancer by analyzing our distorted thoughts and correcting those thoughts. But it does not promote feeling of detachment or other self-reference problems. Better prefrontal cortex function and planning abilities and healthier neural response to perceived threats. Better problem solving, improvement in a broad spectrum of disorders and improvement in well-being. And it's now been shown in controlled randomized trials to not only significantly improve depression, anxiety, and helping you to overcome an addiction, but even personality disorders, marital issues. And studies show when we compare them with medicines, CBT is actually as effective then, uh, in, as compared to medicines, but you don't get the side effects with the CBT. And uh, it also, the effects last far longer than with the medicines and less relapse. So in CBT, you're actually taught to judge your thoughts as rational and helpful versus irrational, inaccurate, and defeating, or just plain wrong. And it's actually fun. A lot of people don't want to do this. They don't want to, uh, it be when they come here, they're a little fearful of it. But once they learn it, it's actually fun, and uh, it's enjoyable, and their brain significantly improves, and they're able to um, actually change their biochemistry through this as well. Notice CBT improves brain serotonin levels and the activity through synaptic changes that take place as a result of changing our thoughts in the right direction. And then of course in our residential program we also have the spiritual component. Uh, this really helps us on the positive versus negative emotions. Colossians says, set your affections on things above, not on earthly things. This, is, this can help us in regards to that positive, negative thing um, very uh, significantly and also help us in correcting our thoughts. And this is a key element that many programs miss out on 
that many consider at the end to be the most helpful to help them with their comprehensive self-control and the things that they can do to continue to have their depression and anxiety eradicated. So studies on the residential program, we have published a lot in the scientific literature, but the residential program, and we've looked at almost 2,000 individuals going through, 98% of participants that come here significantly improve in their depression and anxiety scores in just 10 days. More than that, improve, but I'm talking a significant improvement with a 10, uh, with at least um, a 50% drop in their depression and anxiety um, scores. Uh, depression is actually eradicated in 10 days on the Beck Depression Inventory in 68.4% of attendees. Now, it'll be significantly improved in the vast majority of the rest, and we have, we actually call this a 20-week program because it takes 20 weeks for these brain changes to be locked in, and so we'll continue to see improvement throughout 20 weeks. Anxiety, this surprised us because anxiety is known to be far more difficult to treat than depression as far as medicines are concerned. But in our program, anxiety was eradicated in even a greater amount in just 10 days, 81.6%, with once again 98% of total participants with significant improvement. And emotional intelligence skyrockets in the program. The average person coming to our program has an EQ of 95, slightly less than average for the general population. But it will jump over two standard deviations to the top 20 percentile of the nation. This is very gratifying because not only is depression and anxiety eradicated the vast majority of the time in 10 days, but now they're set up for the highest levels of success. And this is why we call it an investment. When we invest in that person, what a difference comes out financially, productivity, family-wise, uh, as well as in the workplace. So we've now uh, published scores of studies. It's the most scientifically studied program for depression and anxiety worldwide now with the highest end values, uh, and in other words, much higher than what you'll get in a lot of medication studies. And it's now seen to be the most effective, low-cost approach to depression and anxiety. And it's been shown to help people with all sorts of reasons for their depression and anxiety. Whether they've had adverse childhood events, abuse, even post-head concussion, autoimmune diseases, those with significant addictions such as um, sex addictions, porn addictions, uh, tobacco, alcohol, benzo addictions, opioid addictions, screen addictions. Those with chronic infections such as Lyme disease or, or other chronic infections. Those who are not fit. Those who are on a standard American diet that don't want to change. Uh, those who have been abused. Those who've had even stroke. This amazed us. We found out 90% of individuals with stroke where their brain has even died in a portion of their frontal lobe actually see significant benefit in the program by improving their brain biochemistry. Diabetics improve, uh, poor sleep quality people improve, uh, and uh, the list goes on. And so uh, I would encourage you, if you know someone, uh, yourself, your family, others that need to be fixed, don't delay. Uh, get the comprehensive approach that will make a difference. And I thought I would end with a couple of, of case uh, studies. Uh, one that uh, I will uh, talk about in regards to the uh, methylation side of things. Let's see, um, do I have to end the show here, um, uh, Paul, to get over to this or no? Uh, do you no, know? Uh, yes, on that you will. Okay, but it'll still be... Um, I've got you full screen. Okay, good. So um, I wanted to uh, mention uh, uh, Stacy. Uh, she came to our program in her early uh, 40s with a history of depression that had been going on since high school. After her first year of law school, the depression got worse and she was started on medications. Uh, then she had a, an accident uh, where she had um, head trauma um, her second year of law school. And uh, during recovery from this physical trauma, her depression deepened significantly and she was tried on six different medications, sometimes in combination, and was still no better. 
she had to take uh, time away from law school because she couldn't uh, make it. And, uh, and during that time, she was put on sertraline or Zoloft, Welbutrin, Zyprexa, which caused her to have unwanted physical and facial movements, and amitriptyline, which caused a lot of weight gain. Uh, since these more standard medications didn't work and she needed to get back to law school, she was p finally put on the most potent and the most dangerous class of antidepressants called the monoamine oxidase inhibitors. And so selegiline was added with Welbutrin or Bupropion combined. She had to restrict her diet with no cheese, rich foods, alcohol, or foods with tryptamine. Um, and the combination of medicines plus her very strict diet worked enough to allow Stacy to go back to law school and complete her course of studies. But due to her disability uh, of depression and anxiety, her bar exam could not be passed. And normally they allow so many times to pass it, but because of this certified disability, she was allowed to take it over and over again. And uh, finally, after the fourth time, she was able to pass. And she landed a job with an important East Coast law firm, uh, married another attorney in the law firm. And uh, after a case she was working on was not successful, she took this very personally, and her depression and anxiety considerably uh, worsened. Um, she was put on EMDR uh, therapy, ketamine infusions, uh, finally, transcranial magnetic stimulation, which seemed to work temporarily for a few months, then severe relapse, followed by more TMS, then another relapse. Uh, she was told she needed to be either permanently disabled or placed on ECT, uh, but her husband found out about our program, and this was after her third now uh, TMS uh, treatment. At this time, she was taking Abilify, uh, Trintelix, and Vyvanse, which was used for her ADHD, which is kind of a, um, a legal form of methamphetamine. She had been unable to work for eight months before coming to our program. And um, she, of course, had seen uh, every um, you know, traditional uh, psychiatric or psychiatrist and counselors, and um, they had basically um, stated that, um, you know, uh, she wasn't going to get better unless uh, ECT, which of course shockwave treatments can cause permanent brain uh, memory losses that you'll never be able to get back in certain um, areas, etc. So uh, she even tried the keto diet and she was on this ideal protein keto diet. Uh, that failed as well. And um, and uh, she had a child already, but was not able to take care of that child due to her functional uh, problems. And of course, with her not working, finances were challenging as well. And so um, she even tried inpatient care. Uh, and um, uh, when that failed, uh, she ended up coming to our program. So when I met her for the first time, she had deep sadness. She cried through most of the interview. She had an increase in irritability, was constantly feeling on edge, had obsessive negative thoughts, and was now starting to experience panic. She had become more impulsive with one of her signs of impulsivity being self-medicating with food, which was adding to her obesity. Uh, many people who casually met her thought she was very calm though on the outside, but inside she was quite tense. And so I realized that every one of those presenting symptoms were signs of low brain serotonin. And we did the blood tests, indeed confirmed that she was a significant uh, undermethylator. And uh, this is why if giving serotonin in a pill or in an IV could increase brain serotonin, it would be the most popular um, you know, approach. But the way to do this is actually through nutrition and um, lifestyle. So, uh, in, uh, amazingly, although it took some time, after TMS it normally takes a longer period of time for a person to get better, um, Stacy was able to um, improve. Uh, we actually added SAM-E to her regimen at first. That didn't seem to do a whole lot during the first um, few days, 
but then we added um, uh, saffron, saffron and SAMe together. We've actually put together in a uh, supplement now called Mood Balance. Those are the two most expensive um, nutritional supplements for depression uh, simply because they work, but they're also expensive um, to uh, produce and put in a pill. And we were able to actually um, put them together cheaper than what they would have been individually. Uh, by working with the nutraceutical companies. And so she had to stay an extra week, but by de day 17, her depression and anxiety were almost gone. And within less than two months, she was able to discontinue first the Abilify, then the Trintelix, and finally her other medicines. Her husband said, it's been like being in the deepest, darkest night in contrast to the most beautiful, bright, and shiny day. Uh, the tests one year later continue to show no depression, no anxiety, no ADHD. Um, she's able to focus. She's doing well in her work. She's doing well in her mothering. She's a wonderful wife. She's now down to her ideal weight. And she's feeling physically, mentally, and socially, as well as spiritually better than she can ever remember. And her boss has noticed her increased productivity. Um, she's actually gotten raises since then. And at home, her artistic and musical ability, which had been gone, uh, returned. So her executive functions have also improved. And uh, these are all symptoms of adequate serotonin activity in the brain. In short, those with a healthy abundance of serotonin produce uh, the best neighbors. What is her regret? Her only regret is she did not find the program in her late teens and 20s. She said the process of finding and treating the underlying causes through nutrition and lifestyle would have saved her years of academic, social, emotional uh, problems, it would have saved her employment and her relational turmoil, and the simple dietary changes of the plant-based diet, which she continues to be on, plus the mood balance and physical exercise, which she is very religious about, has made all the difference in the world. And so uh, this is an example. We have many of these complex cases come to us, but we would rather have cases come to us at an earlier phase before they try all of these things. They won't need to stay 17 days. 80% of our patients are more able to get better in just 10 days. But if they need a longer period of time, like the 2%, by the way, that 98% um, data is from 10 days. So what happens to the 2%? We don't, don't just kick them out of the program and say, sorry, it didn't work. We know these principles will work. But in someone like Stacy, it's going to take an extra week for those uh, principles to start working and maybe some additional supplementation to augment our ability to produce uh, in abundance the biochemical challenge that has been there for a number of years. So uh, hopefully this is helpful. We could tell a number of other stories, uh, but maybe we can get uh, to that in a later webinar, or uh, maybe we can bring about it as a result of the questions. But uh, I wanted to open it up uh, for some questions at this time and uh, see if we can answer this. I think these are going to be sent in to us uh, via uh, text. And so uh, let me um, uh, read them now. So a uh, uh, question, what would you advise someone with both schizophrenia and premenstrual dysphoric disorder? So uh, of course, we'd want to um, confirm the schizophrenia. Many times it's schizoaffective disorder or a drug-induced psychosis. We've seen a lot of marijuana-induced psychosis, by the way, recently. Uh, just look that up over doubling the risk of, of uh, psychosis. But this is something that can actually improve with time and with lifestyle um, therapies. And so with premenstrual dysphoric disorder, we mentioned that could be a serotonin issue. But uh, often with those two combined, it's actually a pyrrole disorder, a metal metabolism disorder, and this is where brain balance uh, comes in. I didn't mention this earlier, but when we make too much norepinephrine, not enough dopamine, that's when we can get into these two problems. And brain balance was designed to help us make less of the norepinephrine 
and more of the dopamine and balance those out. And uh, so uh, I would actually recommend that the person get uh, serum tested. Uh, you can also uh, call our office to uh, make some uh, phone consultations in regard to this. Sometimes we can um, uh, balance this out uh, by having you um, have these research labs done and can make a significant difference that way. Or you could also see if the person could actually qualify for the uh, residential program. Uh, so uh, here's uh, a, a question about can any of the neurotransmitters help in autism? And uh, the answer is yes. Um, with autism, we often see that excess free copper due to a genetic issue of not being able to bind onto metals, particularly a low ceruloplasmin. We'll tend to see ceruloplasmin significantly less than 30 in these individuals, and they tend to have excess free copper. The autism can be helped significantly by lowering that copper through zinc and the B vitamins um, that we have available in brain balance, and we have to gradually increase it. We don't want to give a lot of zinc up front because the copper will come down too quickly and the person will have some tremors, but uh, getting that, um, that gradually increasing the brain balance until the achieved effect is there and until the free copper level is somewhere between 5 and 25 percent. Uh, question, uh, what should I do if I need to come to the Nedley residential program but can't afford it because of unemployment? Well, I can tell you this is our typical uh, case. I just um, told you about someone that was unemployed for eight months uh, before coming. I would encourage you to reach out to those who can help. Take it in a form of a loan. Uh, you know, I talked about uh, Stacy. I remember uh, Christy who had to take out her program in a loan. And within one year, she had made up um, the rest of that and even more. Uh, she was um, actually donating to the causes here at Weimar University and, uh, and plus paying off uh, the people that had helped her uh, in the process. And, uh, and we see that story repeated uh, many times. So this is well worth the investment. Have the individuals around you think of it as an investment. Uh, but uh, that is, um, it's well worth it. Anyone who's actually borrowed money on this program, I've never uh, heard that they've regretted it uh, down the road. Uh, they've all been uh, thankful, and uh, I think virtually all have been able to recuperate it. Not right away, it can take a year or so to catch up, but that catching up will then build more and more on the financial side of things as the years um, go on. So does the uh, program help with premenstrual dysphoric disorder? Yes, the answer to that is definitely yes. And uh, what would you suggest uh, for borderline personality disorder? Uh, borderline personality disorder, we've seen a number of them in our program, actually respond very well to the biochemistry analysis that we do. Borderline personality disorder people cannot actually do CBT until their neurotransmitters are enhanced. So the cognitive behavioral therapists all get frustrated with the borderline personality disorder people because they can't actually analyze their own thoughts, correct their own thoughts. These are people that think all of their problems are caused by others and not by themselves. Uh, but actually after we enhance the brain biochemistry of a borderline personality disorder, they actually can respond to CBT. And a uh, comprehensive uh, lifestyle approach will greatly help a borderline personality disorder patient. Parkinson's disease, a question about that. Parkinson's disease is a problem of not making enough dopamine in the substantia nigra. And that also can be due to copper toxicity. So we've had a number of individuals do well with both brain balance and L-tyrosine. We need L-tyrosine in larger amounts, maybe 6,000 milligrams a day. Uh, to have the remaining cells in the substantia nigra be able to make more dopamine, and we have seen some success that way. Uh, we don't cure Parkinson's disease, but we can help better manage it, particularly because of the uh, dopamine augmenting things that we are doing uh, in the program, but also the cognitive and the other um, aspects. So, uh, 
I don't see, I'm sure there's some more questions coming in. Uh, do you know, uh, Paul, if you can... Uh, uh, okay, so if you have more uh, questions, uh, you could um, contact uh, Nathan Nedley, uh, Nathan at NedleyHealth.com. He might be able to forward those um, uh, to uh, me or be able to get with you uh, himself um, regarding this. But uh, I certainly hope this is helpful. You might want to go back and replay it because we went over some things rather quickly uh, here today. But uh, rest assured that there is a lot to neurotransmitters and mood. And as we optimize brain chemistry, we can optimize your mental health. But remember, it takes a combination. It's not just one thing, like a supplement. Uh, those can make a difference. It's actually the combination of things. And this is why someone like Stacy says, I never could have done this on my own at home. How would I have been able to exercise in the condition I was in? How was I going to be able to change my diet? How was I going to be able to analyze my thoughts and to know precisely my biochemical defects? Um, no way, she said, could this have been done on my own. But here, it was simple. And now I can do it on my own and maintain. And so... Um, uh, we would like to encourage uh, those that need uh, that uh, program. Another uh, question, uh, should I leave my antidepressants and use mood balance? Uh, the answer to that is no. Do not leave your antidepressants unless your doctor is helping you to wean off of that. Now, it, notice in Stacy's case, we didn't take her off her antidepressants when she came here. Uh, we actually were finding what her biochemical defects were in fixing that, and then eventually she was able to wean off the medicine. So we wait for patients to get better first. Now, if the side effects far outweigh the benefits, we might actually take them off a of medicine earlier rather than later, but that should only be done by a doctor because stopping your antidepressants abruptly uh, and replacing them with a supplement uh, could cause more harm than good uh, and some of these antidepressants need to be weaned slowly. Other ones can be dropped off uh, rather quickly, and so you need an expert in not only how, uh, how to put people on these medicines, you need to find an expert in, in taking uh, people off of the medicines and doing it in the right way. But we like to fix the defects first before the medicines are withdrawn. I hope that makes sense. Well, uh, I certainly wish you all the best of health of body, mind, and soul. And uh, we uh, wish you uh, the best of your mental health uh, going forward. And if, there are, is there anything, if there's anything we can do to help you or your loved ones or the ones you know along this process, please don't hesitate to reach out and call us. Uh, Sarah and Sally are great people to uh, get to know on the phone and they'll help you uh, get well connected uh, to our staff if need be. Thank you very much.